welcome to the SEAL Construction Journal Online. This is where we chat to SAISC members and leaders within the broader built environment. So I'm here with Gustav Rode and Teddy Ducker from uh, Zutari. We're going to chat a little bit about the decision to move to a co-CEO role. Uh, Teddy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your, your story? Let's, let's hear from you. Well, I've been associated with the, with the group uh, since probably as early as mid-2000s uh, when I started off as a, just a shareholder, became a director, an executive director, and as the business grew into global markets, uh, I ended up being the global chairman of the business. But I retired uh, off that role and um, I'm back. Great. And Gustav, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your kind of career trajectory within the group? Well, I've, uh, I've been with the organization uh, my full career. Uh, so it's a full 35 years. Uh, I've seen it as a, a smaller practice, grew in Africa until it became very big, went uh, international, global, and also I've been leading us coming back to Africa uh, the year before last, 2019, and uh, I've been a CEO for uh, for quite a while and delighted that I can share this responsibility in the future. Great. So, gents, I'd like to just move on to my, my formal questions. Um, what what prompted the board to to make the decision to follow the co-CEO route? It's, you know, it's rather unconventional. So, what was the thinking behind that? Yeah, uh, let me give you how I understand it, and then Gustav can, can bring in from the person who has been on the board. That coming from the outside, when I look at the, uh, the challenges that the market is facing, and this is not just in terms of the COVID pandemic, but you got to look at how complex and dynamic the market has become. Um, you have to look at the geopolitical shifts that we're experiencing at the moment countries are becoming more nationalistic and this is an impact on, on what it means with globalization. Uh, you have to look at, you know, what's the declining infrastructure spend across the various markets around the world. Um, over and above that, as Gustav will show what we're doing internally in the business, in my view, this required a rethink in how we manage our business. And uh, since part of what we do is to co-create, the board thought maybe two heads are better than one. Gustav? Yeah, Denise, uh, I think, uh, although I, I was at the board at the time, Teddy summarizing it quite well. Uh, we've been a consultant uh, for 90 years, a uh, consulting business, uh, but the market is becoming much tougher, much more difficult, much more complex. Uh, specifically uh, for us is in terms of geography. Uh, we've got offices right across the continent, but last year we also acquired uh, back a business in the Middle East, which is extending our reach in terms of geography. Uh, it's important these days that the C-suite interacts with, with, with clients all across these geographies. So we had to strengthen our C-suite and specifically the, the CEO role. And then also is we're in a journey of digital transformation. And some of these things, it's just making the challenge to lead a consultancy more difficult. And I think we've got a, a unique, uh, solution for that. Right. Uh, Teddy, what are some of the character traits, strengths and experiences? And I'll ask each of you this, but let's let's just start off with Teddy. What are the, the character traits, strengths and experiences that, that you bring to this this new structure? Well, let's start first of all with most CEOs. I mean, if you look at Gustav uh, and myself, we are all seasoned professionals with extensive local, regional, and global experience, and having worked at uh, very senior levels. Uh, both of us understand the built environment uh, space. I mean, combined, I think it's about uh, 50 years of experience between Gustav and I in, in this environment. So we, we, we come with this behind us, but then we also have our own individual flavors and skills that we bring through. Uh, I, I have a very strong digital uh, skills uh, expertise, having run and started a company within that space. If you look at where the industry is going, uh, we have to digitalize our businesses. We have to think differently in how we can deliver value to our clients at a much, much lower cost because of depleted budgets, but still maintain the quality of the service that we have to do. 
I have a very strong turnaround strategist background and challenging markets are spaces where I work very comfortably in. And if you couple that with my extensive network that goes beyond public and private sector, beyond one geography to a number of geographies where we would like to grow our business, I think I bring something uh, to the table that is exciting to Zotari. Great. Gustav, do you want to chime in there? Um, what is your kind of unique skill set or flavor that you bring to the, the partnership? I think it's a, a good partnership, as Teddy's mentioned. I mean, I probably prefer not to talk about myself, but I've been, been leading the business for quite a while. So I've got uh, good engineering skills. I've, I've led a business in terms of risk on major projects. Uh, I know the risks associated with that, and I've been in business for a long time. What I'm excited about is uh, enhancing our business further or strengthening it with Teddy's skills. He's a seasoned businessman. He's been with us on this global journey for, for 10, 14 years. So there's a lot of trust between us. And I also think we, he did mention digital savvy. I think our business is usually challenged by that, et cetera. So I think it's, it's a complementary skills is going to be to the benefit of Zutari. Gustav just said he doesn't like talking about himself. <laughs> I will summarize him with a different anger. See, I've, I've worked with Gustav for a long time. Uh, he brings really deep te technical skills, but more than that, he has a tenacity to run large, complex, and diverse operations uh, spanning multiple geographies. And uh, that's, that's, that's something that I think we need to value. And I think which will bring uh, something to bear on this business to make it a better business than what it is today. So, Teddy, can you maybe elaborate on some of the, the key objectives you'd like to achieve in terms of digital transformation and, and technology and strategic partnerships, um, you know, looking at the future growth of, of Zutari? Well, without, first of all, giving much of our competitive information, I'll, I'll brush at a high level and allow Gustav to go more deep into the operations. First of all, we, we need to think and prepare the business for post-COVID world. I think this pandemic, if anything, has managed to force businesses, governments, and you know, civil society to think differently. How do we continue to deliver superior quality of solutions and services to our clients, whilst at the same time understanding that we don't have the deep budgets that can produce the margins that perhaps hitherto business has enjoyed in the past? In my view, we have to look across the entire value chain of how we operate and begin to digitalize every aspect of the business because that's how you're going to use these new digital technologies to uh, work better, work faster, work smarter, but also deliver quality of service. Gustav? To me specifically on digital transformation, I think the, the whole industry is going through huge change in the sense that we all are exposed and starting to use significantly things like whether it's GPS, lasers, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, etc. So uh, what we are all challenged by, and specifically Zutari is taking that challenge on head, head on, is the fact that it's not about just using these tools, but also transforming the way we use it, i.e. do things differently because of that obviously to the benefit of benefit of, of our clients and society in general. Uh, so I think that's one of our big objectives is to, to use the, all of these benefits from the fourth industrial revolution uh, to our benefit, but also change the way we, we uh, provide our services to, to the market. Great. Anything further you want to add on that question before we move on? Are you happy? Well, you did say something about partnerships. Now, when I look at the idea of partnerships, we are good at what we do, but we're not good at doing everything. And that alone uh, suggests that we need to collaborate and work with other people, whether it's internally or externally. The, 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 what we need to be thinking about and what we would like to do better than we've done before is how do we create partnerships that are lasting and will really result in value being delivered to our clients. So we look, we'll be looking at that much closely, not only in terms of what in South Africa we look at as enterprise development only, 
but really how do we deliver service to our clients and what kind of partners can we collaborate with uh, to make a better life for everybody. Good. So maybe um, Gustav, if you want to start on, on answering this question, then we can hand over to Teddy. Um, has instability in the local and, and pan-African markets built environment influenced your decision to pursue re-entering the Middle Eastern markets? Can you just chat a little bit about what's been happening in, in your different markets? I would say no. I think the reality for us is it's rather the attractiveness of the Middle East market. Uh, because from our African base and our skill base, we can really still export lots of our skills to that region. We don't want people to immigrate, we want to export our services. Um, and also what's I think relevant here is that there's huge interest from the, the Middle East into Africa, into the different countries. A good example of that is uh, this, we currently and we have been involved since 2017 in a major new airport in Rwanda called Lugaresa. Uh, this airport was developed and in 2019, the Qatar Airways uh, bought 60% of this uh, private development, a huge new international airport. And I think that linkages between Africa and the Middle East is something else that uh, we really believe in the future will grow. Teddy, would you like to add anything to that? Yes, um, we don't really classify what's happening in the local, the pan-African built environment market is unstable. Rather, we recognize that markets are tough. There's no doubt about that. But the infrastructure spend tends to be cyclical in nature. We are in the down phase and are perhaps towards an uptick because governments to revive these economies will have to spend in infrastructure as they try and create jobs as well. So there will be an uptick. Um, moving into the Middle East provides us with an opportunity to work on cutting edge projects. And that helps us maintain and improve our global relevance. It provides us with an opportunity to get the young engineers in the company to work on exciting projects that will, can catapult them to global eminence. So that's just an area that gives us that aspect of being remaining relevant and global and creating eminence in what we do above the things that Gustav has mentioned. So now for, for my favorite material, I've got to bring it into the discussion somehow. Um, the local availability of steel, has that impacted um, the design of new structures or completion of projects underway? And can you just maybe speak a bit about how that has affected the business? Denise, the reality is that structural steel is on the critical path of, of any project. So, uh, and you're much more familiar than, than I am with the with the challenges that uh, we had in the last few months. But the reality, if we look at something like the Fort Frame uh, fabrication facility here in Tuane, at the moment we're in the design process is all of a sudden we've got to get more involved in the process to understand and connect our design with the availability of structural steel. So yes, there is adjustments. Uh, the teams are working towards making sure that at least there's uh, the least amount of impact. But the reality is it, it does impact the industry and it will impact finally also the prices of the products. Um, more specifically, I, I know that we are involved uh, with a, a drive from Kucha Development Corporation to really start working with other partners to see how we how, how the, the this complex problem can be resolved uh, and, and improved at least. What do you believe that, that role players across the built environment or supply chain need to do better in order for the industry to, to increase in its health? You know, we've had a bit of a, um, a period of adjustment, uh, but is there perhaps something that the different role players within the supply chain can do um, for the health of the industry? I think there's a number of things that can be done, certainly. Um, Biggest challenge at the moment is that these, there isn't much work packages out there. Infrastructure spend is, is low. So as an industry, if we don't adopt digital transformation for our businesses, it's going to be very difficult to compete. We're losing skills uh, that are emigrating out of, the, and out of the market and people are retiring. So we have to find a way in which we can remain uh, relevant and building new ways in which we can operate. And that's why I'm pushing for digital transformation quite a lot. But at the same time, um, the way we run our businesses need to take matters of ethics a little bit more seriously than perhaps what we've done in the past. We've had cases where the industry has been tainted here and there on these matters. 
ethical management of our businesses is just going to help the industry uh, do better than what perhaps it done in, in, in the past. I think we need to collaborate more. And here I'm not talking about beyond what competition rules uh, say we should not do. I'm talking about in how we relate with the policymakers. There are elements of policy at the moment that is not supportive of what we're trying to do as an industry. And if we collaborate, I think we can find ways in which we can influence the policy uh, uh, designers to think through how what they're doing from a policy perspective may be harming the industry or what they're not doing may be harming the industry because we need this industry to be strong. When infrastructure boom comes back, South Africa needs to be ready to have the businesses and the people and the engineers and the designers that will be able to do this work. Otherwise, we're going to be dependent on uh, bringing more people inside the, the country to sort this problem when we can actually prepare our industry for, for that boom. James, what are you most enthusiastic about in terms of 2021? What does make us excited and uh, we're in the, in the world of infrastructure. And I mean, the Steel, Steel Institute, uh, uh, steel construction is in that space as well. Luckily, we are in a world where, uh, in many countries, it is seen as the way to stimulate the economy again. And I mean, we're delighted uh, for the president uh, Ramaphosa's process in terms of the presidential pro pro uh, program, uh, focusing on infrastructure. Uh, yes, it's slow to happen, uh, but the reality is we will make a difference in that. And that's making us excited about the next year. Teddy, any, any thoughts from you? I can only add to what Gustav has said. Uh, this pandemic uh, for a business such as ours, uh, despite the fact that it's been horrible, horrible in many ways, is also providing a silver line in the sky because it now allows us to bring our advisory uh, capability and advise governments and businesses in how we can actually redesign how we do business and how we respond to the pandemic and the post-pandemic world. That for me is exciting. <music>